of the airway management devices, the quintessential piece of equipment that we often use in the ICU is the endotracheal tube. Many of our patients require a high level of respiratory support for a multitude of different reasons, and the endotracheal tube is the tool that most effectively allows us to do just that, which we will discuss some in this lesson here. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. In this lesson, I'm going to review over the basics of the ET tube and ensure a good understanding of this piece of equipment before going into the subject of intubation in the next lesson. So let's start out talking about what is the endotracheal tube. So our endotracheal tube, or our ET tube, or ETT, is a special tube made of plastic, or really more accurately, a polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. So this material is actually a transparent, non-toxic, flexible, and really inexpensive material that we use for it. The endotracheal tube is passed into a patient's airway and really helps to facilitate breathing, or more practically, ventilation in our patient. It also has protections in place to seal off the airway from anything entering, such as secretions or gastric contents. Now, they are single-use tubes that do get disposed after patient use, although there are additional components used in the placement that are not disposed. I'll actually be discussing these more in the next lesson here. And there are basic endotracheal tubes as well as more complex ones that can add additional functions or safeguards to them. One example is that we can have one that actually isolates off one lung from the other, which is particularly useful for some of our pulmonary surgeries. For this discussion though, I'm gonna mostly be covering our basic endotracheal tube. So next I wanna do a real quick brief history of the endotracheal tube. I'm really not gonna go into depth here, but I just wanted to cover what I think is a pretty interesting history of the endotracheal tube. It's certainly not necessary to understanding this tube itself, so feel free to skip to the next section if you want, but I always find this stuff fascinating. So interestingly, we actually had the first mention of an artificial airway placement of a reed that was inserted into a pig's trachea to treat a pneumothorax, and this was in 1543. Then from there, we actually had a leather-wrapped coiled wire that was used to intubate and resuscitate a neonate in 1754. That said, though, it wasn't really until the late 1800s, early 1900s, that the function that we think of today came about. The development of the ET tube was primarily related to surgery and anesthesia, but it later was adapted to our critical care areas. In the late 1800s, we had various metal tubes that were actually used to bypass obstructions in the throat, reducing the need for tracheostomy tubes, administering anesthesia, as well as helping to prevent pulmonary collapse during different thoracic surgeries. And in fact, the first textbook on tracheal tube intubation was written in 1911, and the first documented use of a laryngoscope to assist and the placement of this metal tube was described in 1913. Then in 1926, we had our first rubber tube that was developed, and then followed this in 1928, where we had the first inflatable cuff being added to that rubber tube. Things continued to develop, and then the polio epidemic of the 50s and 60s really showed the benefit of using the endotracheal tube to deliver positive pressure ventilation. So this is kind of what paved the way for our use today in critical care. And then from there, we had our first PVC tubes that were introduced in the 1970s, which has really become our standard today. All right, so let's talk about the different parts of our endotracheal tube. So most of the ET tubes that we use today have a fairly standard design, which I'll show here, with standard markings, with some slight variation to the appearance, uh, as well as some of those additional functions I told you about. 
So the first part that I wanna talk about is actually going to be the tube. So this is the main part of the ET tube, as you can see, and it's really the pathway for air to move through, into, and out of the lungs. Now our ET tubes do come in different sizes. So this is both the diameter of the tube and the length. Now the size of an ET tube is actually referring to the internal diameter of the tube in millimeters. Now it's usually gonna state on the tube both the size of the internal diameter as well as the external diameter of the tube as well. Now the sizes of these tubes range anywhere from a 2.0 all the way up to a 12.0 and they come in 0.5 millimeter increments. The size of the tube is primarily gonna be based on the size of the patient, as well as potential need for things like bronchoscopy. So typically like a 7.5 or an 8.0 tube is gonna be needed in order to pass that bronchoscope through. Now on average for adults, women are usually a 7.0 or a 7.5, and for men they can range anywhere from 7.5 to 8.5. Again, this is just sort of our average. Do remember though that the smaller the tube, the more resistance there is gonna to be to airflow. So this is particularly important for patients who are gonna be spontaneously breathing prior to extubation, as that smaller tube is gonna have more resistance, making it harder for them to breathe through. So this may actually require additional pressure support in order to overcome this resistance. Now, the length of an ET tube is actually gonna be proportional to the different size that we have selected. That said, if we're actually using a specific nasotracheal tube, that these are generally a few centimeters longer than our orotracheal tubes. Hopefully that makes sense because we have a longer distance to go going through the nose. Now along the side of the ET tube, we're actually gonna have markings that are gonna be either in one or two centimeter increments that are basically gonna tell you the length at which the ET tube is inserted. Now because the PVC or the material that we make these ET tubes out of is not radio opaque, an added radio opaque line is added that extends the whole way down the ET tube all the way to the tip of the tube. So this is essentially gonna allow for better visualization that you can see here on x-ray, really for confirmation of placement as well as proper positioning. Now our ET tubes do also have a curve that you can see here to them. It's something that we call the McGill curve. Its introduction actually came about by accident, which is kind of an interesting story, but really it turned out to be something that was quite helpful. The curve really helps to follow the anatomy of the upper airway and makes for an easier insertion. Really, you have the back of the curve that's gonna be following the roof of the mouth down into the back of the airway. So now let's actually talk about the tip of the tube here. So the end of the tube is actually cut with a left-facing bevel. This bevel allows for easier passage through the vocal cords, as well as that left-facing bezel is also something that's important for better visualization of the tip of the ET tube during insertion. Also at the end of the ET tube, we have a extra opening called the Murphy's Eye. Because the tube is beveled, it has a greater risk of actually occluding the end of it if it contacts the tracheal wall. And so what we do is we have an opening that's cut into the distal side of the wall, and this allows gas to pass through in the event that the end of the ET tube is actually obstructed. Now, near the distal end of the ET tube, there's actually an inflatable balloon, something that we call the cuff. Now, as I mentioned in the last lesson, this balloon helps to seal off the trachea to prevent ventilated air from escaping, as well as preventing secretions and gastric contents and other things from entering into the lung. And essentially, there's two primary types of cuffs. We have what we call high pressure, low volume. So here you can think a smaller balloon that has a higher pressure inflated in there. And these particular cuffs are actually associated with higher risks of tracheal injury. Then from there, we actually have uh, the low pressure, high volume. And so this is gonna be a larger balloon with a lower inflation pressure. And this is the one that we're typically gonna use in the ICU. Now we do also have a small tube called the pilot tube or the pilot line that goes from this cuff and then all the way out to the proximal end of the ET tube, which is essentially the side that's outside the patient's mouth. At the end of this pilot line is actually the pilot balloon and a lower lock attachment. And this is gonna be for attaching a syringe for inflating the cuff with air. And so this pilot line allows us to have a connection in the outside to be able to put air in or make adjustments to the air of that cuff that's now gonna be down in the trachea. But then the pilot balloon itself is actually a reservoir of air that helps to reduce the effects of any minor changes in tracheal pressure, as well as it gives us a tactile feedback for whether the cuff is inflated during its normal use and or whether it's deflated prior to extubation. That said, the pilot balloon is not an accurate measure of overinflation. It really will just give you an idea of if it's too soft, then it's telling us that there's not enough air in there. 
Now, generally our cuffs are gonna be inflated with either 10 or 20 mLs of air. Overinflation, though, could result in either a rupture of the cuff, requiring the replacement of a new ET tube, or tracheal mucosa ischemia. And this is especially over long periods of inflation. So here you can really kind of think of this as a pressure injury of the trachea, specifically from the cuff. So to help prevent this, we do want to ensure that the cuff pressure is 20 centimeters of water or less. And we really should be using a manometer pictured here really to accurately measure this cuff pressure and not just feeling that pilot balloon. All right, the next piece I wanna talk about is actually gonna be the connector. And so at the proximal end of our adult ET tube is a standard 15 millimeter connector. So this connector and size are actually standardized for our ventilator tubing and our bag valve mask attachments. This way we know that they will easily attach and seal to these devices. Now, one other thing I did wanna mention that's really not part of our standard ET tube, but is pretty common, is actually gonna be our ET tubes that also have subglottic secretion suction. So this is something that's often referred to as the high-low suction. And essentially, with an ET tube in place, oral secretions can actually easily drain down into the subglottic space and then accumulate on top of the cuff. The high-low is another smaller tube that allows us to apply low suction to the top of the cuff and really drain those secretions away. The purpose of this is as a VAT prevention strategy and studies have actually shown a 50% reduction in ventilator acquired pneumonia, specifically using one of these devices. So they are somewhat common, but certainly not used by all facilities and you're not always gonna see them, but they are fairly common enough that I did wanna mention it here. All right, so those were the different parts of the endotracheal tube. Next, real quick, I just wanna hit on some of the risks and complications that come from its use. So while there are many benefits, and certainly the ET tube is a valuable life-saving piece of equipment, there are some risks and complications that can result from its use. The biggest issue that we see with its use is actually going to be infection. And our big concern here is gonna be pneumonia or ventilator-acquired pneumonia or VAP. So this can result from the placement of the tube itself or as well as from its prolonged use. And so we do have different techniques and bundles to really minimize these risks, which I will actually cover at some point in a future lesson. We are also at risk for tooth dislodgement during the placement, as well as bleeding, perforation of the oropharynx, uh, or even esophageal placement of the tube. Esophageal placement, though, does require immediate removal and replacement of that ET tube into the patient's trachea. Now, vocal cord damage is something that can also result from either injury during placement, prolonged use, as well as extubation without the cuff being deflated. And then finally, the tracheal mucosa ischemia can result from prolonged placement of the endotracheal tube, especially those that have high cuff inflation pressures. All right, so that was our review of the anatomy of the endotracheal tube. I wanted to give you guys a good understanding of this piece of equipment before I started getting in and talking more about intubation coming up in the next lesson here. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated. So thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.